so what I'm going to do today is sort of give you, as the slide says, a political biography uh, of Ronald Reagan. Uh, by the time that Ronald Reagan took the oath of office uh, on January 20th, 1981, at the tender age of 69, he had already traveled the road from Dixon, Illinois, to Hollywood, to Sacramento, and finally to the White House. He had gone, as we all know, from a New Deal Democrat and union leader to conservative standard bearer and staunch defender of the free market. Coming from genuinely humble origins in the American Midwest, the son of an alcoholic shoe salesman and a deeply religious mom, Reagan left home as a young man to build a new life for himself out west in the fiercely competitive realm, realms of show business and of politics. And against all odds and against all expectations, he succeeded in both. Uh, Reagan's own story has many of the hallmarks of a Hollywood movie. Uh, humble beginnings, quick ascent, romantic difficulties, setbacks, and an eventual against all odds triumph. Uh, but one of the things that I want to point out today, and we're going to do this today and tomorrow and on Saturday as well, uh, is that his story is not his alone. Uh, the so-called Reagan Revolution did not come out of nowhere, nor can it be attributed to one man, uh, no matter how keen his political instincts. Rather, Reagan's seemingly improbable victory in the 1980 election speaks at least in part to the maturation of an American conservatism in the last half of the 20th century, and the slow but steady project of organizing, underwriting, and conducting an eventually successful campaign against the New Deal state. So what I want to try to do today, this morning, uh, is to trace out Reagan's ascent to the presidency through the lofts of Warner Brothers, the shoproom floors of GE, the governor's mansion in Sacramento, with an eye to his relationship with the larger conservative movement. This then is what I call a kind of political biography, an attempt to recognize Reagan's own contributions uh, while recognizing that revolutions, if that is indeed what the 1980 election was, are rarely fought, much less won, by a single person, no matter what his or her particular set of skills. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was born in 1911. For those of you who had 1911 in the quiz last night, thumbs up. Um, in the small town of Tampico, Illinois. His was a peripatetic childhood. Uh, he moved with his family five times before the age of 10. Uh, the Reagans finally settled down in Dixon, a small Illinois town with a population of about 10,000 uh, people. Uh, although Reagan was a bit of an outsider in his early teens, by the time he reached high school, he'd become a kind of big man on campus, a senior class president, a member of the varsity football and baseball teams, and in charge of the school's drama club. Uh, he was also a town lifeguard, uh, and in the, I believe, six summers that he served as town lifeguard, uh, he's credited with saving 77 lives. Uh, that may or may not be um, accurate, um, but that is uh, the sort of number that is given. Uh, although he left Dixon for college, he didn't go particularly far, uh, choosing to go to the nearby Eureka College, uh, which was a Disciples of Christ college. Uh, his uh, mother was a member of the Disciples of Christ. Uh, that also, I believe, was on the quiz last night, so if you got that, two points for you. Um, where he majored in economics and received average grades, uh, but excelled in other areas of college life. Uh, in athletics, in his social life, uh, and I believe with the ladies as well. Uh, after graduating college, Reagan found work in radio, uh, where he worked first for a very small 1,000-watt uh, station in Davenport, Iowa, uh, and then for a much larger station in Des Moines, uh, where he quickly made a name for himself with his ability to recreate Chicago Cubs baseball games uh, by providing a colorful play-by-play -play version of the contest from a bare-bones account he got over the telegraph. Uh, although the nation was still mired in the Great Depression when he took this job, uh, Reagan made a comfortable living, uh, earning $75 a week for his broadcast work. Uh, Reagan could have stopped there. He was happy in Iowa. He liked working on the radio. He liked calling the Cubs game. He was making a pretty OK living for himself. Uh, but he was a deeply ambitious man. Uh, and he did have dreams of Hollywood stardom. Uh, and so in 1937, he traveled with the Chicago Cubs, uh, volunteering his own vacation time to go out to California, uh, where he'd set up a meeting with an agent who set up a screen test with Warner Brothers. Uh, and Warner Brothers called him, or called his agent, pretty quickly uh, after that screen test and offered him a long-term contract with the studio uh, for about $200 a week. Uh, it was a seven-year deal at $200 a week, and he took it immediately. Uh, Reagan worked his way up 
through the studio system that dominated Hollywood in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, appearing first in B-movies and eventually winning roles in some of the studio's bigger and more prestigious features. Uh, perhaps the most famous of his roles uh, was as Notre Dame uh, footballer George Gipp uh, in Newt Rockne, All-American. Uh, altogether, Reagan appeared in 31 films between 1937 and 1942, uh, when the outbreak of World War II put a kibosh, a temporary halt, uh, in his film career. Uh, Reagan immediately joined the Army, uh, serving in the Army Air Corps for three years, uh, although he never left the States. Uh, in fact, he never left Southern California. Uh, Reagan's job during the war was basically to make training films. Uh, and so he spent the World War II years in Culver City uh, making training films for the U.S. Army. Uh, throughout this period, uh, Reagan remained a New Deal Democrat. Reagan remained committed to the New Deal project. Uh, he later described himself as a New Dealer to the core. Uh, and when the war ended, he joined a host of liberal organizations, including the Americans for Democratic um, Action, uh, as well as a number of other liberal organizations. Some of them he quit fairly quickly, believing that they were simply fronts for communist organization. Uh, but he still considered himself in this period of his life uh, a real new dealer. Uh, Reagan also took an active part, as we all know, in labor organizing for the Screen Actors Guild, uh, serving as the organization's president uh, from 1947 until 1952, uh, and then again for a year in 1959. Now, the Screen Actors Guild is not the United Auto Workers, right? Uh, and Ronald Reagan was not Walter Ruther. Uh, but he was good at negotiating, and he did get good deals for the members of his union. Uh, many of his bio biographers have suggested that his experience in working with the Brothers Warner, uh, in working with other studio heads to get things like residuals for his union members, uh, later served him well in negotiating first with the democratically dominated California legislator, legislature when he was governor, and then of course with Democrats in Congress uh, when he becomes president. Uh, Reagan's years at the head of the Screen Actors Guild uh, also brought him face to face with one of the major issues uh, of the day, uh, namely communism and anti-communism. Uh, and here's just a picture of Reagan uh, during the World War II years uh, serving in Culver City uh, in the Army's uh, film office. Um, in 1947, the House on American Affairs Committee launched a very high profile investigation into the issue of communist subversion in Hollywood. Uh, the fear here, right, was that communist agents were using uh, the institutions of American media, the institutions of American entertainment, uh, to subvert the American government. Uh, this investigation, launched by HUAC in 1947, ultimately gave birth to the blacklist, uh, which would cast a pall over not only the entertainment industry, but much of American life uh, between 1947 and about 1961 or 1962. Uh, and Reagan was a willing and enthusiastic participant in HUAC's attempts to ferret out communist subversion in Hollywood. Uh, here we have a picture of Reagan uh, testifying uh, before the House on American Affairs Committee. Uh, he played an active and willing part in these investigations, in part because he believed uh, in what the committee was doing. He believed that, quote, Stalin was out to make Hollywood an instrument of propaganda for his program of Soviet expansionism. Uh, Reagan, during this period, even agreed to act as an FBI informant uh, regarding communist activity in the movie colony. Reagan's staunch anti-communism, of course, stayed with him for the rest of his career. Right? This was, in many ways, a very formative moment in his political development. Uh, this period also helped to undermine his faith in the Democratic Party and in liberals and liberalism in general. Right? So this is a moment in which his New Deal beliefs are beginning to weaken. Uh, he is beginning to uh, leave the New Deal and to leave the Democratic Party. Uh, although Reagan voted for and even campaigned for Harry Truman in 1948, uh, he was increasingly convinced the Democrats were insufficiently attentive to the communist threat, uh, both at home and abroad. Uh, and ultimately, these beliefs are going to play a key role in his uh, journey from left to right. The late 1940s also marked the beginning of the end of Reagan's film career. Uh, he'd never been a huge star 
I think uh, in one ranking, sort of a variety ranking in 1941 or 1942, he was ranked about 75 uh, in the list of Hollywood stars, uh, which is higher than I am. Uh, but still, you know, not, um, he's no George Clooney, right? Uh, but he was on a sort of upward swing in 1940 and 1941, but the war interrupted that, and he could never really get that momentum back. Uh, plus, when the war ended, he was older, right? And Hollywood values many things, uh, but old age is not one of them. Uh, and his acting talents were not quite sufficient uh, to overcome the fact that he was getting older. Uh, and Hollywood is a town that values youth, vitality, uh, and good looks. Uh, you also see sort of changes in the entertainment industry in this period. Uh, television is on the rise, uh, cutting into films market share. Uh, Reagan's career probably hit rock bottom uh, in 1954 uh, when he took a three-week gig in Las Vegas uh, hosting a uh, Vegas-style review at the Last Frontier Hotel, uh, basically just to pay the bills. Uh, in some ways, though, the end of his film career uh, and the fact that these film roles were drying up uh, opened up new possibilities for him, right? Uh, it's the fact that he couldn't find work in film uh, that drew him to TV. Uh, and it is that work for GE, uh, for the General Electric Theater, uh, that ultimately drew him into politics, uh, ultimately completed what we might think of as his political education. Uh, ironically then, it was television, the medium that he believed was killing his film career, uh, that both rescued Reagan's show business career and pointed him uh, towards a post-showbiz career in politics. Uh, in late 1954, uh, Reagan signed a contract with General Electric uh, to host the Appliant Giant's new weekly television program, the General Electric Theater. Uh, he basically introduced sort of these uh, Sunday night movies, uh, although I believe he also starred in a couple of them. Uh, the series was a hit, and it ran for eight seasons on Sunday nights at 9 o'clock. More important, though, to Reagan's political development uh, and to this political biography that we're sort of set sketching out here, uh, the deal with GE required him to travel around the country visiting GE factories and giving speeches. Right? So not only was he required to host a television show, he was required to go out and talk to people on GE shop floors. Uh, this was a deliberate attempt by GE management uh, to make workers like the company better. Right? to undercut the appeal of unions, uh, and to sell not only the company, to sell not only GE, but the idea of the free market uh, to these workers uh, so that they would be less inclined to strike, less inclined to join unions, uh, less inclined perhaps to vote for politicians uh, that would make both of those things possible. Uh, the idea behind this was to give workers a sense of identification uh, and connection with the company by allowing them to meet one of its chief spokesmen. Uh, Reagan spent approximately six weeks a year, uh, 16 weeks a year, I'm sorry, touring GE factories uh, and speaking to GE employees and their families. Uh, at first, these talks were relatively innocuous tales of Hollywood, uh, but eventually uh, they grew more political uh, as Reagan increasingly lectured workers about the virtue of private markets uh, and the dangers posed by international and domestic communism. Uh, Reagan's work for GE was part of a deliberate strategy uh, employed by a guy named Lemuel Boulware, uh, who was GE's labor relations expert. Uh, and like many businessmen at the time, uh, Boulware didn't like unions, he didn't like regulation, uh, and he wanted to get rid of both. But he also understood that you couldn't just break strikes, right? You couldn't just rail against the machine. You had to provide workers with an alternative. You had to convince them uh, that the company, that the market was what would work for them, not unions, not regulation, uh, not the liberal state. Uh, Bulwer coupled then attempts to break unions, which he was perfectly willing to do, uh, and to roll back New Deal regulations with outreach, outreach designed to educate GE workers uh, on the benefits and even morality of the free market. Uh, and it was during these years at GE that Reagan broke up with the New Deal for good, that Reagan broke up with the Democratic Party for good. Uh, he'd begun to move away from the Democratic Party, as I've said, in the late 1940s. Uh, he voted for Eisenhower in 1952. Uh, he'd done so as a Democrat, 
Uh, he didn't actually change his party registration until 1961, I believe. Uh, he campaigned for Nixon in 1960 uh, as part of the Democrats for Nixon campaign, uh, believing that being a Democrat would be more politically valuable in that campaign than simply being a Republican. Uh, his reasons for leaving the Democratic Party really sort of boil down to two things. One, anti-communism, right? He believed that the Democratic Party was not sufficiently uh, anti-communist, was not as uh, robust in its anti-communism as it should be, uh, and also the issue of taxes. Uh, Reagan made a fairly good living, uh, both in Hollywood and as the host of the GE Theater, uh, and he believed that the progressive tax system, which had been put in place in 1942, was taking too much of his money. Uh, and that these high rates of marginal taxation in the 1940s and 1950s uh, essentially eliminated any incentive to make additional pictures each year, right? Uh, and so he often, he translated his own experience with the disincentive effects of the tax system uh, to a sort of broader critique of progressive taxation uh, and the liberal state that that progressive taxation funded. Um, as I said, like many Americans, he abandoned the Democrats in 1952 to vote for Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower had only recently become a Republican, uh, so he might not want to see this as a sort of uh, definitive moment. Uh, but as I said, by the 1960s, he had definitively left the New Deal behind. Um, in the early 1960s, Reagan branches out, uh, giving these speeches uh, that he'd been giving to GE workers for about six years now, uh, starting to give a version of this speech to business groups, uh, to uh, other conservative organizations. Uh, he contributed to the growing conservative movement uh, in the United States in the early 1960s, writing articles for human events, uh, joining the board of the Young Americans for Freedom, uh, which was a conservative youth group established by William F. Buckley uh, in 1961. In 1961, that same year, uh, he also releases a LP uh, of an address that he had given on the dangers of socialized medicine. Um, here then, Reagan's political career and political development overlapped and coincided with um, larger developments in American politics. Uh, although few recognized it at, a, at the time, um, American conservatism was on the rise in the early 1960s. And if you'd said this to people in the early 1960s, particularly people outside of the conservative movement, they would have said that you were crazy. Uh, and in fact, there was a great deal of literature that came out in the 1960s from political scientists, from social observers, that said that conservatism was essentially dead, right? That we were living in the middle of a liberal consensus. Um, they, they were wrong, right? Uh, but that's what people were saying. Uh, but what's happening here in the 1950s and 1960s uh, is that conservatives are organizing below the radar in many ways. Uh, conservatives had been on the defensive uh, since the Great Depression since the Great Depression, uh, saddled with the legacy of President Herbert Hoover's impotence in the face of economic collapse. Um, conservatives in the United States were down, but they were not out uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, conservative businessmen uh, and intellectuals had worked to beat back, or at least to contain, uh, the New Deal um, and the New Deal state, founding organizations such as the American Enterprise Association, uh, and underwriting, underwriting in, uh, intellectual defenses of the free market, uh, such as Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. This important work in the 30s, 40s, and 50s then laid the groundwork for a conservative revival in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, but in this early post-war period, conservatives had a lot of trouble translating this to a popular movement. Right? It was popular in certain circles, uh, but when it came to sort of electoral success, uh, when it came to moving the needle on discussions, uh, they were less successful. Uh, but new issues emerged in the 1950s to mobilize conservative voters. Uh, the civil rights revolution uh, and white resistance to it uh, threatened in the 1950s and 1960s to tear the Democratic Party apart uh, and undermine popular support for liberalism. Uh, and the Republican Party was sort of faced with the choice of what to do, right? How do we respond to this challenge to sort of the Democratic coalition uh, that had dominated American politics since 1932. Uh, some Republican strategists and politicians argued that the party should reclaim its historical reputation uh, as the party of Lincoln and win back those black voters uh, who had defected en masse to Roosevelt uh, and to the Democrats during the Great Depression. Uh, but other voices in the party hoped to capitalize on racial tensions uh, to bring the white South into the GOP. 
Uh, conservatism uh, began to take shape at the grassroots not only in the American South, uh, but outside of it as well, uh, particularly in Sunbelt states like Arizona, like Southern California, uh, where grassroots conservative activists began to organize first around local issues uh, and then around more state and national issues. Uh, those local issues included educational issues, sex education in particular, uh, anti-communism, property rights, and property taxes. Uh, these mobilizations then formed the backbone of grassroots conservative movement uh, that soon threatened the leadership of the Republican Party uh, and helped to bring conservatism to the forefront of American politics in the 1960s. Uh, the budding conservative movement, of course, crystallized in the um, candidacy of Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater in the 1964 presidential election. Uh, like Reagan, Goldwater was a product of movement conservatism uh, and a favorite of businessmen fed up with unions and with government regulations. In 1960, a group of conservative businessmen eager to improve the conservative senator's national profile uh, convinced Goldwater to put his name on a conservative tract, a ghost written by Buckley brother-in-law L. Brent Bozell, uh, called The Conscience of a Conservative. Uh, and this is a moment that really does illustrate the way in which this conservative network worked. Right? So here is Senator Goldwater, uh, who had come to the attention of uh, important figures in the conservative movement, largely because of his resistance to uh, the Kohler strike. Um, there was a strike in the late 1950s at a Kohler plant in Wisconsin. It involved the UAW. Uh, the Kohler workers ultimately win, but this is a moment uh, in which Goldwater sort of proves his conservative bona fides by standing up to Walter Ruther. Uh, but you have then the connections between these businessmen who are underwriting the publication of this book, intellectuals like Buckley, right, whose brother-in-law is actually writing this book. Uh, the Conscience of the Conservative was then distributed to uh, employees at places owned by these conservative businessmen. Uh, but it was a national bestseller at well, as well. Uh, and in many ways, it was sort of a surprise national bestseller, uh, because it was a very short volume, uh, which essentially ran through conservative talking points uh, against Social Security, against labor unions, against agricultural supports and progressive taxation, uh, and in favor of a much more robust anti-communist policy. Uh, the book's popularity, even in the age of Kennedy, even in the midst of Camelot, uh, provides some indication of the hidden strength of conservatism uh, at the height of the so-called liberal consensus. Uh, Goldwater's nomination in 1964 was somewhat of a coup. Uh, the political establishment, the Republican establishment, did not want Gold uh, Goldwater as their standard bearer in 1964. They believed he was too radical. Uh, they believed he was too conservative. They basically believed he was a terrible general election Canada. Uh, they would have preferred someone like the moderate Bill Scranton uh, from Pennsylvania or even the liberal um, Nelson Rockefeller of New York, uh, who had, of course, shot himself in the foot in terms of his electability uh, by his um, divorcing his first wife and maybe a little bit too quickly marrying another. Um, but Goldwater was put on the, the ticket thanks to the activism and organization of grassroots conservatives in places like California. Uh, grassroots conservatives rejected what was then known as modern republicanism. Uh, modern republicanism is associated with the Eisenhower years, uh, and its detractors sort of believed it was nothing more than the Diet New Deal. Right? This was New Deal light at best. Uh, and conservative activists believed that the Republican Party, uh, in order to win and in order to make a real difference, needed to offer, in the words of Phyllis Schlafly, uh, who was a key conservative organizer in the 1960s and would lead the anti-feminist movement in the 1970s, needed to offer vo voters a choice rather than an echo uh, to democratic liberalism. Uh, Goldwater's campaign, in some ways, uh, was a disaster for the Republicans. Uh, he won only his home state of Arizona and five deep south states, uh, thanks at least in part to his vote against the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1964 uh, and his opposition to any federal uh, civil rights protection. Uh, the Democratic Party successfully countered his campaign slogan, uh, in your heart, you know he's right. There you go. Uh, with their own rejoinder, uh, in your guts, you know he's nuts. Uh, playing on this sense, right, uh, that Goldwater's militarism, uh, Goldwater's anti-communism uh, was so extreme 
And of course, he was known right, for his defense of extremism, uh, in defense of liberty, uh, that it would destabilize the world. Um, and y'all, some of you are probably old enough to remember this campaign. Uh, one of the, um, you know, the key television advertisements from this campaign is that Daisy Girl ad. Uh, in which a very young, very cute, freckled girl uh, is pictured taking right, the petals off of a daisy and counting them. One, two, three. And then this very ominous voice comes in from the background. Ten, nine, eight, <laughs> mushroom cloud. Right? And the whole sort of notion here was that Goldwater was too extreme. He was too dangerous uh, to be trusted with the presidency. Uh, and ultimately, this was a successful, uh, successful message. Uh, Goldwater not only loses in a landslide, uh, but Johnson has fairly long coattails in 1964, uh, bringing new liberals, not just new Democrats, but new liberals uh, into both the House and into the Senate. Uh, but if the 1964 election killed Goldwater's uh, presidential uh, aspirations, it gave Ronald Reagan's a boost. Um, the actor played a key role in Goldwater's campaign, uh, particularly during the home stretch and in his home state of California. Uh, Reagan, I believe, was the chair of California's, uh, the Goldwater campaign in California. Uh, and in October, of 1964, at the end of October of 1964, uh, the campaign bought time for a commercial uh, that featured Reagan delivering a prepared speech to an expectant audience. Uh, this speech that he gave was a speech that he had given so many times that it was simply called the speech. Uh, it was a version of the speech that he had been perfecting, that he had been honing, that he had been giving to GE employees in the 1950s, to other conservative groups and business groups in the early 1960s, and it was a barn burner. It was a distillation of conservative ideology, but also the conservative critique of the New Deal state. Uh, known formally as a time for choosing, later known simply as the speech, uh, the address railed against liberal programs, attacked the New Deal state, uh, and warned against the communist threat uh, both at home and abroad. Uh, it was also a full-throated defense uh, of the free market, not simply as an economic system, but also as a moral system. Right? Uh, and in some ways, this marks the coming of age uh, of this defense of the market uh, by American conservatives, by transatlantic conservatives uh, in the post-World War II period. Uh, so if this works, we will watch. This is the final four minutes of this address. Um, and as I said, right, this is a, really a recreation uh, of an address that he gave to uh, conservative donors uh, in 1964, uh, and a version of a speech he'd been giving for quite some time. So as you would pray our freedom for the suffocation of the welfare state and told us they have a utopian solution of peace without victory. They call their policy a combination. And they say it will only avoid any direct confrontation with the enemy. He'll forget his evil ways and learn to love us. All who oppose them are indicted as warmongers. They say we offer simple answers to complex problems. But perhaps there is a simple answer, not an easy answer, but simple. If you and I have the courage to tell our elected officials that we want our national policy based on what we know in our hearts is morally right, we cannot buy our security, our freedom from the threat of the bomb by committing an immorality so great as saying to a billion human beings now enslaved behind the Iron Curtain, give up your dreams of freedom. Because to save our own skins, we're willing to make a deal with your slave masters. Alexander Hamilton said, a nation which can prefer disgrace to danger is prepared for a master and deserves one. Now let's set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war, but there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace, and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this, but every lesson of history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement. And this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends <coughs> refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement. And it gives no choice between peace and war, only between fight or surrender. If we continue to accommodate, continue to back and retreat, eventually we have to face the final demand, the ultimatum. And what then? When Nikita Khrushchev has told his people, he knows what our answer will be. He has told them 
that we're retreating under the pressure of the Cold War, and someday, when the time comes to deliver the final ultimatum, our surrender will be voluntary, because by that time, we will have been weakened from within spiritually, morally, and economically. He believes this because from our side, he's heard voices pleading for peace at any price, or better read than dead, or as one commentator put it, he'd rather live on his knees than die on his feet. And therein lies the road to war, because those voices don't speak for the rest of us. You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? Just in the face of this enemy? Or should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery under the pharaohs? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots at Concord Bridge have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard around the world? The martyrs of history were not fools. And our honored dead, who gave their lives to stop the advance of the Nazis, didn't die in vain. Where then is the road to peace? Well, it's a simple answer after all. You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. Churchill said the destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. And he said there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, which, whether we like it or not, spells duty. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. We will keep in mind and remember that Barry Goldwater has faith in us. He has faith that you and I have the ability and the dignity and the right to make our own decisions and determine our own destiny. Thank you very much. So one of the things that sort of strikes me about this, and we can talk about this a little bit in the sort of question and answer, uh, is that you know, this is supposed to be in some ways a closing argument for Barry Goldwater, right? And yes, there's only sort of four minutes here that we're, we're listening to, but we hear his name twice, right? Uh, the other thing, so in some ways it's more of a announcement of Reagan's political career than it is a closing argument for Goldwater, right? Uh, but he's also very skilled at establishing a relationship between himself and the audience, right? If you think about the sort of rhetorical tools he uses here, you and I have to do this. You and I are facing this challenge. You and I understand in ways that they don't the challenges that we're facing, the threats that we're facing. Barry Goldwater never really learned to do that. Uh, and in part, I think that this ability, that Reagan's ability to connect with audiences, to make arguments that make sense to people that aren't in the church, right, to people that aren't committed conservatives, comes from his experience working with GE going to those shop floors, talking to working class folks about, about these ideas, right? Those were not people that were necessarily on board with the agenda. Uh, and so he had to figure out ways to sell it, right? He was the consummate salesman, first of himself, uh, then of GE products, uh, and then ultimately of these kinds of ideas. Uh, and I don't think that we should discount Right, the value of salesmanship, uh, particularly in the modern presidency, when you do have to command the airways, when you do have to command attention. Uh, he was quite skilled at using the bully pulpit, first in Sacramento, uh, and then ultimately in the White House. Uh, this campaign, or this campaign spot, makes Ronald Reagan the next star uh, in the conservative firmament. Uh, it's pretty successful, not in getting Goldwater elected, obviously, uh, but in bringing some money into the Goldwater campaign in those last and final days. Uh, indeed, uh, it was a star-making performance. Uh, after it aired, the Goldwater campaign received $8 million additional dollars in campaign contributions. Uh, it was, according to veteran political analyst David, David Broder, uh, the most successful national political debut uh, since William Jennings Bryan electrified the 1896 Democratic National Convention with his Cross of Gold speech. <laughs> 
Uh, soon after the 1964 election, uh, California conservatives convinced Reagan to challenge the incumbent uh, governor, uh, Pat Brown, uh, in the 1966 race for the governorship. Uh, Reagan surprised observers with both his political acumen and his relative pragmatism. Uh, chosen by his backers for staunch conservatism, uh, Reagan ran to the center right in a deliberate attempt uh, to win over moderate Republicans and conservative Democrats. Uh, Reagan's campaign in 1966 uh, focused on the supposed failure of the liberal Brown government and by extension Great Society liberalism uh, as a whole. Uh, he took particular aim at liberals' inability to contain and control racial unrest, a uh, racial unrest that had become apparent uh, with the Watts Rebellion of 1965, uh, and also to clean up what he called the mess at Berkeley. Uh, and here we have a picture uh, of the free speech movement, <coughs> uh, which uh, took off uh, at the University of California at Berkeley uh, in 1964, uh, and was a part of a larger student movement. Uh, against authority, against what students called the multiversity, uh, in order to uh, live a more authentic life. Uh, for some, particularly those involved in the student movement, uh, this was a sort of seminal moment. This was a way of redeeming the promise of American independence. Uh, but for others who looked at these kids at these universities and saw in them sort of entitled brats taking for granted all of <laughs> Uh, the privileges that they'd been given. Uh, Reagan's uh, stand against these Berkeley students and these Berkeley protesters endeared him to them. Um, Reagan was underestimated by his opponents uh, in 1966, uh, and we'll see that this is sort of a theme uh, in his political career. Uh, and it wasn't until too late that Pat Brown realized that he was up against it. Uh, and ultimately, Reagan does win that election in 1966, uh, carrying 55 of California's 58 counties uh, and taking 58% of the statewide vote. Uh, as governor of the uh, nation's largest state, uh, the state with the sixth largest economy in the world, um, Reagan demonstrated a ability to compromise that's going to actually mark his political career. Uh, rather than an ideologue then, I would say that Reagan was an ideological pragmatist. He understood that you needed to get things done. Uh, for example, despite his abhorrence of taxes, uh, two months after taking office, uh, stricken by the state's financial situation, uh, Reagan called for the largest tax hike in the state's history uh, and worked with the Democratic State Assembly to revise the state's tax system to make it more progressive. Uh, despite his opposition to abortion, uh, he also signed into law the Therapeutic Abortion Act of 1967 uh, that allowed for abortion on mental as well as physical health grounds. Uh, he later said that he regretted this um, decision. Uh, his record and his general likability were enough to win him re-election in 1970. Uh, as governor of California, Reagan naturally became part of the national political conversation. As I said, largest state, sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, in 1966, Time magazine put Reagan on its cover uh, and predicted that his name would soon, quote, crop up in connection with the party's vice presidential and even presidential nominations in 1968 and 1972. Uh, in 1968, he put out presidential feelers, uh, launching a kind of stealth campaign uh, that was designed to see if there was anyone that was going to bite there without alienating the sort of leaders in the National Republican establishment. Uh, he sat out the 1972 election. Uh, there was no way that anybody was going to beat Nixon in 1972, uh, except of course Nixon uh, beat Nixon in 1972. Um, but when Watergate brought down the Nixon administration and Jerry Ford alienated conservatives by choosing the liberal New York Republican Nelson Rockefeller as his vice president uh, in 1975, uh, Reagan threw his hat into the ring uh, for the nomination in 76. Uh, the struggle for the GOP nomination that year went down to the wire. Uh, Reagan battled Ford through a long season of bruising primaries and state caucuses. Uh, going into the Kansas City Convention, neither candidate uh, had managed to win enough pledge delegates to be assured of victory. Uh, but in the end, Ford marshaled the powers of incumbency uh, and eked out a win on the first ballot by a slim margin uh, of 1,187 votes to 1,070 votes. And one of the sort of interesting things to think about here, and I often pose this question to my students, is well, there's sort of two counterfactuals here, right? So what happens if Reagan wins that, the nomination in 1976, right? Beats out Jerry Ford. Does he beat Jimmy Carter? 
Uh, and then the second counterfactual is what if Ford wins in 76? And he has the economy in the late 1970s. And he has the oil crisis of 1979. Right? Does Ronald Reagan still get elected in 1980? And of course, we can't know. Right? That's a thing about counterfactuals. Uh, but it is a sort of interesting thing to think about. Right? Uh, Reagan was an incredible politician, but he also benefited from being in the right place at the right time, as do all successful politicians. Uh, if Reagan lost the battle for the 1976 primary, he won the longer term war uh, and emerged from the race in surprisingly good shape. Uh, he worked in this period to maintain his national political profile. Uh, indeed, he began his 1980 campaign for the presidency uh, almost as soon as the votes were counted in November of 1976 and Jimmy Carter uh, had won the presidency. Uh, in November, Reagan formed a political action committee known as the Citizens for the Republic, uh, which he bankrolled with $1 million in campaign funds left over from his effort to unseat Ford. The late 1970s were an auspicious time for a conservative revival. And here we're talking about the man and the moment, right? Uh, the Roosevelt coalition had all but fallen apart, and the Democratic Party was in disarray uh, in the 1970s. More critically, and I'll talk about this in more depth tomorrow morning, uh, the Keynesian consensus that had guided both Republican and Democratic economic policy uh, had more or less fallen apart. Uh, by the mid-decade uh, in the face of sluggish economic growth, spiraling inflation, and high unemployment. Uh, equally important, U.S. business had rediscovered its political voice in the 1970s. Uh, by the middle of the decade, business interests were forming political action committees at more than twice the rate of organized labor. Uh, business understood that it needed to get involved in politics in order to shape policy that would suit its needs. Uh, conservative money men also devoted considerable time and money to developing the kind of conservative counter-establishment uh, by founding or reviving pro-market conservative think tanks uh, from the venerable American Enterprise Association, renamed the American Enterprise Institute, uh, to the new Heritage Foundation. Foundation. Uh, these centers issued a steady stream of ideas and policy prescriptions. Uh, they also took advantage of new organizing technologies, uh, including most notably the use of direct mailing lists. Uh, and conservatives were way out front uh, in sort of targeting constituencies uh, and bring, bringing those constituencies into a broader movement uh, than were their liberal counterparts. Uh, business interests, of course, had long railed against the New Deal, uh, but it wasn't until the 1970s that they were able to uh, sort of shape the national discourse. Uh, and we can see this in the sort of fact that liberal stalwarts like George McGovern uh, and Teddy Kennedy in some ways get on board uh, um, for this pro-market uh, agenda in the late 1970s. Uh, George McGovern supports a massive capital gains tax cut in 1978, uh, writing an op-ed in favor of it in uh, the Washington Post. Uh, the Carter administration had attacked this as the Millionaire's Tax Relief Act. Uh, Teddy Kennedy leads the deregulation charge uh, in terms of communication and transportation deregulation in the 1970s. Uh, so we can see that this is sort of a bipartisan uh, effort in many ways. Uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, conservatism had begun to coalesce as a grassroots political movement around social issues. Uh, conservative activists mobilized around opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment, around opposition to the Roe v. Wade uh, decision uh, and reproductive rights. Uh, the controversy over busing and other measures to remedy de facto uh, rather than de jure segregation uh, awakened opposition to racial liberalism outside of the American South. Uh, by the end of the 1970s then, as Reagan made his final play for the White House, uh, conservatism stood resurgent, uh, a movement with growing political clout and funding, well-developed ideas, and grassroots energy and savvy. Uh, nevertheless, right, the election of 1980 was a hard-fought slog. Right? This was not an easy march to victory over a weakened president, uh, which in some ways I think our sort of popular memory has it. Uh, it was much closer, and it took far longer uh, than perhaps we would like to imagine. Uh, though Reagan's image has been burnished in subsequent years, in 1980s he was deeply unpopular. Uh, he was a deeply divisive candidate uh, with higher negatives than any major party nominee, uh, at least, of course, until this year. Um, <laughs> Reagan did, of course, face a weakened opponent in Carter. Carter had a terrible economy. Uh, he was facing a year-long hostage crisis, uh, a uh, sort of sense of uh, a crisis of confidence enveloped the nation uh, in the end of the 1970s. Uh, nevertheless, 
right? Voters had significant doubts about Reagan's competency, about his ability, about his fitness to be president. Uh, as late as mid-October, the race remained neck and neck. Uh, Reagan's own pollster found Carter up by two percentage points in October of 1980, uh, and other national polls likewise found the incumbent with a narrow but steady lead. The tide turned in favor of the challenger with that debate. Uh, in Ohio in October of 1980, uh, when Reagan not only met but exceeded expectations. Now, it may have helped that some people's expectations were quite low, right? And so the bar was set quite low, but he seemed a plausible president. Uh, and given Carter's unfavorables, given this sense of malaise, right, that had settled on the country in the end of the 1970s, a plausibly competent alternative was enough. Now, was this a revolution? And that's sort of the big question, right? If you look at the exit poll data in 1980, it doesn't seem to be a mandate for conservative governance, right? Uh, those people that voted for Reagan, only a small minority described themselves as very conservative. Uh, only a small minority said that they voted for Reagan on the strength of his ideas. Uh, this was perhaps best understood as a change election, right? We need to try someone else. We need to try something else. This isn't working. Let's give this guy a shot. He seems like a nice enough dude, right? Uh, and so one of the things that we'll think about, I think, over the next couple of days is how that We'll call it a tepid mandate, right? Gets translated into a revolution, right? Both in 1981 uh, and then in our sort of larger memory of this period. Uh, that's all I've got for now. Uh, if you all have any questions, I am eager to take them. Yes. People didn't trust Reagan's back, his ability to govern. Mm -hmm. And yet, Carter had been a governor. Yep. Reagan had been the governor of the sixth largest economy in the world. Sure. The largest state. Where, 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 did, where did the doubt come from? Because these candidates had very similar political backgrounds. Similar political backgrounds, although I think that there was a sort of question about Reagan's intellect, right? Uh, Jimmy Carter was a nuclear scientist. Uh, Ronald Reagan was an actor. Uh, and so part of this is informed by that biography. Uh, part of it is informed by Reagan's own tendency to misspeak. Uh, he was not a, probably a master of details. Uh, and so uh, that then fed into these ideas about his intelligence or his lack thereof or his lack of intellectual curiosity. Um, of course, that served him well in that debate, because Jimmy Carter answered questions with a lot of detail uh, in ways that were not particularly compelling. Uh, Reagan offered fairly simple explanations that aimed to revive a sort of sense of American optimism. We can do this. We just need to try. Right? Whereas uh, Jimmy Carter perhaps had a more realistic assessment of where the nation was. Uh, but nobody really wants to hear that. Yes, sir. Um, in West Virginia, we saw in the 70s the bridge to this, the right religious and the right political, mm -hmm. um, through a textbook war. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, what we saw there was this religious right, and we also saw the Heritage Foundation. Mm -hmm. I don't see the Heritage mentioned much in any we've had, but it was a very powerful force yeah. beginning at that moment and still is. Yeah. Yeah, no, the Heritage Foundation and the sort of establishment of what we might think of as a conservative counter-establishment in the 1970s is one of the key parts of this story because they had a lot of money and places like the Heritage Foundation were dedicated to getting political results, right? So they were not quite like the American Enterprise Institute or the Brookings Institute, the sort of, you know, left-right information think tanks, they were out to get political results uh, and to create political outcomes. Uh, and so what the Heritage Foundation does very successfully uh, is that they develop not only these mailing lists, right, to bring people into the movement, uh, but also these very short policy briefing papers that you can read on the metro on your way to the hill, right? These are not 40-page briefing things with a lot of numbers you have to go through. These are back and front briefing papers uh, that you can read on your commute uh, so that you know 
what the sort of talking points on X, Y, and Z bill are. Uh, but one of the things you do see, right, are these ways in which the political right and the cultural right uh, are meeting in the 1970s. So textbooks are a big thing. Uh, sex education uh, is a big thing. Uh, one of the sort of key moments in the mobilization of uh, both the political and the cultural right is the IRS decision in 1978 uh, to rescind tax exempt status uh, to many public schools, uh, most of them established in the South, most of them uh, private schools, most of them established in the South, most of them established after 1969 uh, when the Supreme Court finally says no. Right, you can't stop, you can't keep pushing off desegregation. Uh, so the IRS sort of tries to rescind uh, this tax exempt status, and this is a whole kerfuffle, right? This is one of those things that mobilizes uh, both, you know, it, mo it touches on all of these things. It's about taxes, uh, it's about regulation, uh, it's about our kids, it's about schools, it's about values, it's about race. Uh, and so it's one of those things that gets all of that stuff religion. together. Yeah, and about religion, right? Because these were, you know, putatively, Christian schools, right? Whether or not they were actually sort of religious schools, uh, that's what they were called. Uh, and so it brings all of those questions uh, into the fore. Yeah? What was the political relationship between Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon? Well, so Nixon was a hard guy to know. Uh, Nixon was also deeply ambitious, uh, and I think that he understood in Ronald Reagan a significant challenge to his own political ambitions. Uh, Nixon had hoped, right, that he would be the founder of the conservative alternative to the New Deal order. Uh, he had in his mind what he called the new American majority. Right? He was going to bring together white workers, uh, middle class, middle managers, uh, people sort of alienated by democratic liberalism and by social and cultural liberalism of the 1960s. He was going to be the founder of this new political order. Uh, he, of course, shoots himself in the foot on that, right? Um, breaking the laws and violating the Constitution and whatnot. Um, but I think that he sort of understood uh, that Reagan, Reagan was, a, was a, not an adversary so much, but a competitor. So they worked, they didn't work together. Uh, although one of the things in my book, my research has a lot to do with welfare policy. Um, Nixon proposes this guaranteed annual income uh, in 1968 and 1970. Uh, and at the same time, Reagan is proposing a different kind of welfare reform in California. Uh, and Nixon basically looks at what Reagan is doing in California and is like, dudes, why didn't you tell me to do that one? Right? That one is going to work a lot better politically than this guaranteed annual income, which everybody hates. Right. Um, so I think there was a little bit of that. Well, I, yes. 1980, I was very much a part of that campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, I can only tell you that we were way behind. Down like 30 points in August. Yeah. And the uh, answer to your question is just simply one word. We won because of likability, which was first and for the most part expressed during the debates. Yes. I paid for this microphone, Mr. Green. <laughs> and words to, that had to do with the, the bacon, John Anderson, and they tried to cut, cut off his bike. <clears throat> the fact was, we saw strength, whereas, of course, uh, Carter, incompetent Carter, was totally, totally beyond his pay grade, having lost four countries to communism in four years <laughs> Nicaragua, Angola, Afghanistan, Iran. Total embarrassment on every level. Interest rates of 20%. Couldn't sell a house. Mortgages were 12%. Mm. Nobody could buy a car unless you paid cash. I mean, it was a disaster in every regard, and he was a total incompetent in every way. Just a, and his, his uh, cabinet was. But of course, if he was a total incompetent in every way, why was he running 30 points ahead in August? Well, because he was familiar, and they didn't know what he had. Ronald mm -hmm. Reagan. Ronald Reagan, of course, was elected twice in the sixth place sure. economy. But it all came down to likability. And, yeah. and, and that's how people vote in this country. It's emotional. They don't read, they don't know issues. The great unwashed masses don't read your position papers. Everything I wrote at that campaign didn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. It was just a television appearance and likability of that one great man. I'll tell you this. I suggest that he, Ronald Reagan, was the second most photographed person in the history of the world. Only to bring Elizabeth. You consider his career. Yeah. Consider his movies. Consider his 
incredible likability throughout his entire, he was a star from high school. He was a star in college, he was a star in the radio, he was a star in the Hollywood. He was a star. Yeah. And why? Good looks, yes, but it was likability. And charisma. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think likability and charisma sometimes go hand in hand, but sometimes they don't. But he, of course, was, you know, he was a president for the television age, right? <coughs> he was a president uh, who knew how to mobilize star power, who knew how to mobilize the power of image. Uh, and one of the things that we'll sort of talk about tomorrow uh, is this sort of, you know, invention of a mandate. And you were there, right? So how do you govern, you know? You, you won by a sort of landslide, right, in November, but it wasn't a definitive one, right? People weren't. We lost only six states the first time, but one state the second. Right. But as you said, right, this isn't an ideological election, right? People are voting for change. They're voting for the guy that they like, right? They're voting for something else and not Carter and his cardigans, right? We're going to vote for somebody else. Um, <laughs> and so how do you sort of stage manage those first couple of months uh, so that you have you can manufacture, I think, a mandate, and that's what y'all did very successfully that maybe wasn't there in November. Yeah? Uh, that was just a 45-minute biography, because I've never heard of anyone. Uh, you might add to this, obviously, Reagan was this great, likable person, and we started to put that last item, self imposed more about him. If you want to take a look at the real Reagan, then you might take a look at YouTube, 1967, he had a uh, discussion, debate, whatever you want to call it, with Bill Buckley. Mm -hmm. And in that, in, he was the governor, of course, of California at that time. And it's really, really worthwhile taking a look. You can come back for free and look at that. Yeah. One other comment about Mr. Carter. I lived in Georgia at the time, and Mr. Carter, President Carter, could, Governor Carter, could not have been reelected governor of Georgia at the time. He was a very, very unpopular governor at the time. Now, and of course, he wins in 76 in part by being an outsider, right? In part by being a very humble, non-imperial, you know, we don't want another Johnson, we don't want another Nixon, right? We want this peanut farmer slash nuclear engineer from Georgia uh, who's going to figure out common sense ways to get out of this mess that we're in. And I always knew things at that time. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, that was, again, excellent presentation of political biography. But I want to ask uh, a personal biographical question. What should we make of the fact that he grows up in the home of an alcoholic father? Yeah, and sort of his biographers have either focused or not focused on that to different degrees. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure that I'm necessarily comfortable getting someone I don't know on the couch right, uh, and sort of trying to psychoanalyze them. Uh, but certainly when you read about Reagan and you read about his personality, he was guarded, right? Yes, he was incredibly charismatic, right? But he was also very difficult to know. Uh, and I think the sort of psychological studies of, children's of children of alcoholics suggest that there is, though, they do tend to put up those kinds of walls, right? Uh, and so one biography that I read of him, uh, you know, sort of, examine the influence of his father, right, his alcoholism, but also his mother, uh, who was an incredibly optimistic person, right, uh, who told him time and time again, everything happens for a reason, right. Uh, so alcoholism is a disease. You need to make the best of this tomorrow is another day. Uh, and so I think maybe you see those two things in his personality, the sort of guardedness, right, but also this, you know, perennial optimism of making the best of a situation. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow um, when we talk about economic policy uh, and particularly the ways in which the administration sort of spins and understands debt and deficit, right? They didn't expect it at first, but in the end, oh, hey, this will starve the beast, right? This will at least stop liberals from making more programs. Uh, so making lemon out of lemonade there. Yeah. Uh, two things, uh, just to follow up on what you asked, Bob. Uh, Reagan drank very, very little, and you know, we, we all know people who grew up in, in families with alcoholics, and in many cases, that just completely turns them off of alcohol, so that's, that's, that, that's one thing. But I agree with, uh, with Jerry, this was a great 45 minutes of preparation uh, for uh, what, what we're studying, but I don't think you mentioned the word Nancy one single time. I did not. I did not. You know, you're trying to get uh, 
You're trying to get to the things. That's why it's a political biography. Uh, and of course, right, uh, there are those that would blame her uh, in, I think, a fairly sexist way, right, for everything that was wrong with him. She was the harpy. She was the one that was pushing him to the right. Uh, she was this sort of domineering woman. Uh, and I don't think that that's, that quite gets at it either. Um, but no, I am, uh, I'm not a biographer. Yeah. I just wanted to throw out Jimmy Stewart's great quote. He said, if Ronald Reagan had married Nancy first and not Jane, he'd have won an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good note. <laughs> Thank you all very much.